Welcome everybody to Reclaiming Your Money Community Budget Advocacy Strategies. Um, thanks to everyone who is joining us. Um, encourage everyone to introduce themselves in the chat to each other. Um, I think to kick us off, um, I'll first be turning it over to our first presenter, Stephanie Campos Bowie with the UC Berkeley Policy Advocacy Clinic. Um, she will be walking us through our first agenda item of the day, which is to talk about AB 1869, what that is, um, what it did, and the impacts um, for our counties. So Stephanie, you want to take it away? Yes, and everybody can see the slides. We're good. Cool. Okay. All right, so thank you, Adriana. Uh, as Adriana said, I'm gonna give a quick overview of some of the recent changes in state law that no longer allow counties and courts to charge certain um, fees in the criminal legal system, and then describe some of the funding that was set aside as backfill for counties and courts. Um, so to start with um, the kind of new laws that are in place, um, there was AB 1869 and 177. I'm going to start with AB 1869. Um, so it went into effect last year, July 1 of 2021, and it ended the assessment. So the charging of all new fees um, ended the collection of all um, outstanding fees and then also required the discharge or writing off of all associated debt which we estimate to be about $15.9 billion across the state of California. Um, the bill impacted 23 fees in particular, which are broadly um, described on the slide. So uh, arrest and booking related fees, uh, fees related to probation and parole supervision, uh, pre-trial and all, on other alternatives like work release and work furlough programs, and then a lot of the fees associated with representation by public defenders or court appointed counsel. Um, as part of the budget um, deal in getting this bill passed, the legislature did set aside $65 million um, each year um, as backfill for counties starting in 2021 and, and going all the way until 2026. Um, so to describe that a little bit more in detail, the $65 million, um, Again, the idea that this is going to backfill revenues allegedly lost from the repeal of these 23 fees um, starting last year until 2026. Um, the first disbursement of that $65 million went out late last year um, in 2021. Um, and there is a particular funding methodology um, in deciding how much each county was going to get. Um, our coalition, the Debt-Free Justice California Coalition, tried our best to get um, the legislation to actually um, be explicit about where the money should be going, because um, we obviously want the money to go back to communities who have been had their wealth extracted. Um, unfortunately, we did not um, get that um, into the bill language. And so obviously, we're here today to, to learn from each other about ways to influence that. Um, but there was a methodology that was included in the bill that theoretically um, was meant to help um, not reward counties, essentially, that were over policing some of its residents. And so you'll see that 50% of the money is based on population and then 25% each based on arrest rates um, and, and misdemeanor or felony and misdemeanor filings. Again, with the idea that we don't wanna be rewarding counties for um, over policing and over arresting people. Um, that methodology was uh, finalized in October of last year. And again, the money was sent out um, late um, November and December of 2021. Um, but to give you a snapshot of what this looks like in practice, what does this 50%, 25% look like? Um, there is um, a sheet that I'm happy to, to send out in the materials after that gives you a sense of how much money each county got. Um, so you'll see Alameda through Los Angeles on this slide, um, Alameda getting 2.3 million compared to Los Angeles, which got about 16.5 million. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide, which covers Madera and Shasta. Um, if you're interested in your particular county, um, feel free to drop in the chat um, what um, county you're in, and I'm happy to, to put the associated dollar amount because I know I'm going through this a little quickly. Um, and then lastly, Sierra through Yuba. So collectively, again, all the money that went out across all 58 counties um, amounts to $65 million based on this methodology. Another thing to uh, keep in mind about um, Assembly Bill 1869 is that it did come with some, I think, helpful reporting requirements. So by May 1 of this year, 
each county is going to have to report on the actual revenue loss from these 23 fees that were repealed. Um, so for each individual fee, each county is going to have to report for the last three years that they were collecting, how much were they actually collecting? Um, and if for whatever reason they don't have the data, they're going to have to describe how it's calculating its revenue loss. Um, so again, I think it'll be interesting to see um, what counties come up with on this point. The other piece related to backfill in our conversation today about budget and funding, um, by January 10th of 2023, um, counties are going to have to report on how they use the backfill funding. So they're going to have to provide the total annual budget of the departments that end up receiving the funding. So for example, if the money were to go to the sheriff's department, they're going to have to give the total annual budget for the sheriff's department, what share of the funding that department received. Um, and an accounting of the expenses, aka how much of the uh, how the money is being used. And so particularly it, it describes a description of the programs, services, et cetera, that the funding is being utilized for. Um, I think we're all very interested in seeing um, how counties are actually going to meet this requirement. Um, but again, hopefully it'll it'll help us in our advocacy at the local and state level. So that was AP, AB 1869. Um, AB 177 is the newest bill um, that went into effect earlier this year and um, addressed an additional, additional 17 fees broadly related to incarceration, diversion programs, and some of the fees and costs um, associated with restitution and restitution fines. Um, similar to 1869, it ended the assessment, so no new fees going forward, and um, ended the collection as well as required the writing off of all of the debt. Uh, $50 million was set aside annually for counties as backfill associated with this bill. Unfortunately, it does not sunset. And in other words, it does not end in a particular layer, year. It's going to be ongoing. Um, so we'll see kind of how that plays out in the budget processes going forward. Um, but again, this $50 million is ongoing as opposed to the $65 million with 1869 um, that is capped after 2026. Um, the methodology for how the money is going to be dispersed is still being worked out. I think we should be finding out that fairly soon later this year. Um, so we can definitely um, update you all as we learn more about that. And then the last thing I'll just um, flag is we are actively tracking implementation to make sure counties and courts are in compliance. And so we've sent letters to all the counties and courts about their responsibilities under 1869 and 177. Um, we've also now sent Record Act requests to all counties and courts related to AB 1869 to get an understanding of how much money that they're actually writing off for people and if they're actually doing that. Um, so if you're interested in understanding what your county is doing in particular, or what documentation that we've received, definitely feel free to email me um, at the email addresses listed on the side, AB1869 at clinical.law.berkeley.edu or AB177. I'll also drop those in the chat um, for people to look at um, in case that's of interest. And with that, I will turn it back to Adriana. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so what Stephanie just described is quite a bit of money coming from the state to our counties. So the next question is, how are our counties going to receive that money? Um, what are they going to do with it? And what are some ways that we can get involved in that process? So to tell us a little bit more about the county budget processes and how they receive and handle funds like the AB 1869 and 177 backfill funds, I'm going to turn it over to Mayanna Kalfani King, who's with Advancement Project. She's a budget expert and she's gonna let us know what's what. Thank you. And can we all see the slides? I think we're good. Okay, awesome. Okay, so going a little bit into our local budgets and advocacy and taking a special look at AB 1869 and 177 and how that impacts the budget. Um, so Advancement Project, I'm with the Equity and Community Investments teams, uh, and we really look at budget and budget advocacy and uh, helping communities really transform neighborhoods and really look at invest, uh, reinvesting and divesting from public safety and uh, historical harms to communities. 
So a little bit about how the presentation is gonna go. We really want participants to understand the budget basics and give advocacy tips, but also look at how the budget process in AB 1869 and 177 impacts that. So we'll go over the budget, the budget process, what is budget advocacy, how we can engage in budget advocacy, and then a special look at the supplemental budget um, and the governor's budget for AB 1869 and 177. So what are local budgets? Budgets are forward looking financial plans. They really tell you like what's gonna happen and where investments are gonna go. They're also supposed to reflect, re reflect the priorities and values of communities, but often that's not the case. Um, budgets traditionally follow a timeline. So they start July 1st of a given year and end June 30th of the next year, um, but decisions that impact the budget really can happen year round. And then even after a budget is adopted, there's still opportunities uh, to make modifications and influence the budget throughout. So some key budget terms before we really get started is a fiscal year. Um, so before when I talk about the time period between July 1st and June 30th, that's what describes as a fiscal year. So a budget begins on July 1st and ends June 30th of the following year. Right now we're in fiscal year 2022. Um, and that ends on June 30th, and then on July 1st of this year, starts fiscal year 2023. Revenue, you wanna think of it as money that's coming in. So that's cash and credits um, that a jurisdiction receives uh, to really fund uh, all the operations that they're gonna have that year. So that can include taxes and fees, but also one-time funding from the state. So AB 1869 and AB 177 are revenues coming from the state that are gonna help backfill those lost revenues uh, that Stephanie uh, talked about earlier. And expenditures are, if revenues is money coming in, expenditures is money that's going out. Um, and that's really payment for cost and services, materials, equipment, capital improvements. So some additional key terms are, the recommended budget, so that is the first draft. If we're talking about a city, it's the mayor's message or the mayor's budget. If we're talking about a county, um, we're talking about the CEO, the chief executive officer, like that's their first draft that they put out to present to the board. It usually comes out around mid-April and the budget hearings and deliberations are based off that draft. Um, and this year for LA County, it's on the board calendar to be presented on April 19th. An adopted budget are the modifications that happen to the recommended budget. So the recommended budget comes out, you have public de deliberations, public hearings, there's modifications and changes that are made. Um, and then the adopted budget is what the board approves on January, in June um, of that fiscal year. And then later in the year, you have the supplemental budget. And this is where you're gonna have mid-year adjustments. So even though the budget is adopted in late June, like there's still money that's coming from the state and federal and other entities that comes down. And so you'll see mid-year adjustments that happen um, in September and October. Um, so this will be how last year when we saw uh, the money come down later in the year, that's where AB 1869 and 177 was actually hitting the counties and it's reflected in the supplemental budget. This year it's on the board calendar for October 4th. Uh, so when we're thinking about local budgets, oops, sorry, let me move this. When we're thinking about local budgets, there's three true buckets that we're talking about. We have the general fund, um, which is our most flexible dollars and they're unrestricted, meaning that there's no real rules to how this money can be spent. So when we're talking about budget advocacy, like that is the bucket that we really wanna focus on. And sometimes you might hear general fund or net county costs, those are our most flexible dollars. Next, we have special revenue funds. Those are dollars that are restricted, like they have a specific purpose and use for how they can be spent. Usually these are federal and state dollars. And the difference between special revenue and enterprise funds is that those are also restricted dollars, but usually they don't have any connection to government entities, the state or federal. Uh, so those are the three buckets that really go into our local budget. Apologies. Um, so thinking about what happens with our local budgets, we have different types of revenues and expenditures. So for types of revenues, we have taxes, which are 
our most flexible sources. We have property taxes, which are really important for counties and then sales taxes. We have funding um, from government entities, federal dollars. We really think about public assistance programs or ARPA, our American Rescue Plan Act. That's the federal dollars. State dollars, you can attribute to AB uh, 1869 and AB 177 funding. We also have charges for services and also miscellaneous. So that's the money coming in. Money coming out, you have personnel, labor, services, contracts, equipment, capital improvements. Um, but when we're thinking about expenditures, uh, personnel and labor is really important, especially in defund and divesting from public safety. A lot of the money when we think about departments and public safety and policing is really tied up in labor and staffing. So when we want to call for like, true divestment and true removing of dollars, we have to think about staffing and answer those types of questions. Like what is going to happen to the staff? Because we're really asking for layoffs. So going into our budget timeline, we're going to divide this into two sections. This is basically how the budget timeline works. And then we're going to look at it from the lens of how to really have a budget advocacy calendar that aligns with this budget timeline. So between October and March, there's really the development of the proposed budget. Um, the CEO or the mayor um, is really looking at developing the budget guidelines and giving that to the departments. And then from there, the departments are developing their own budget, seeing what they need, what they did last year, what programs they wanna implement. And so all this is happening, really cooking in the pot. When we get to April and May, there's more budget development, um, really getting the proposed budget out. This is where the city manager um, is really talking to the departments, getting their requests and they're making the proposed budget to then present to the Board of Supervisors or to the City Council. Uh, from May to June, we have the proposed budget is released. So it's released to the public, it's presented to the board or presented to the council. And we have our public hearings. Uh, we have all the changes and modifications that's gonna happen. And then the budget is adopted. And then from September and October, we have the supplemental budget. So that's where we have the mid-year adjustments and all the changes to the budget that are gonna happen later in the year after the budget is adopted. But the good thing is going back to May to June, even though there are public hearings that are happening, like you can still go to your city council meetings or your uh, board of supervisor meetings and still in general comment, talk about the budget and talk about really what you wanna see. Uh, so moving into budget advocacy in practice, so how that really works, how we can use it as a tool. So in our budget advocacy, uh, this here, uh, it's really organizing to change the way public resources are aligned to meet community needs. Um, but we want to note that it's only effective when paired with intentional community power building and political education. We want to make sure we understand how local jurisdictions finance programs and services, and also um, really having advocates being able to mobilize community and push for equity in spending decisions. And then when we're thinking about like how can we really get structural wins when we talk about budget advocacy within the budget process, um, we're looking at how we can like eliminate and restructure and create permanent positions. We want to create new departments and new revenue. When we talk about creating and accessing new revenue, uh, we really want to talk about how we can dedicate revenue to a particular program or service that we advocated for in that process. So lining this up, when I talk about the how the budget calendar works, how a sample budget advocacy calendar can work. So when we have the development of the proposed budget and how we prepare for that, we can talk about how advocates and community members can really talk to the department staff. Uh, you can talk to your council members, really get a champion, really engage in your budget research and identify the demands and really get that conversation going. So when we look at the proposed budget, you can see some of your demands already being pushed through. Uh, we have the budget, uh, proposed budget being finalized. So that's still continuing to meet with your champion and decision maker, finalizing your demands. Uh, 
when the budget is released, like really reviewing the budget, reviewing the proposal, seeing what demands are in there, what are left out. You can roll out an advocacy and media strategy uh, once the budget is released. Public hearings and amendments, that's again, more mobilization, more turnout, and then hoping that things can be changed uh, between the modifications once the proposed budget is released and then when the final budget is adopted. But then from the final budget is adopted in June to the supplemental budget, like there's still advocacy opportunities where you can influence a supplemental budget. So this is an example of a budget advocacy calendar that really lines up with our uh, normal budget process. So some steps in building a budget advocacy campaign, you want to understand community priorities, have a clear vision for success, but also understand the budget timeline. You want to be able to conduct a budget analysis, so either you getting the tools to uh, uh, analyze the budget or having to, having a group or someone come in to help see like what are you really looking for what happened last year what areas can we start to advocate to push our demands for this year you want to work with community to develop demands identify advocacy targets and engage with key decision makers and then also build power to make your voices heard throughout the budget process uh, so here, this is uh, budget advocacy impact. So we really think this as circular and really moving um, from the top all the way around the circle. So you have annual budget advocacy campaigns, and that's our year-to-year -year fights, which may be easier, but they're difficult to maintain uh, and difficult to really see like true uh, systematic and structural change. We're moving to deepen community capacity and how budgets are structured. So that's really uh, teaching the tools and really understanding how to understand a buz budget and really move your demands forward. Achieve immediate and implementable wins, build political power and relationships, tackle larger structural funding. Uh, this is where we really wanna move inequities uh, and then defund law enforcement and invest in holistic community wealth and well being. And we see this is really important because a lot of counties and cities have our money tied up in law enforcement. Uh, and we see that in our over policing and in our mass incarceration. So, really moving those funds away from a punitive system and moving them into a reinvestment uh, in community health and well being. So, our next slide is really going to see an example of how. Uh, to tackle larger structural fundings. And we're gonna look at that through the example of the LA County's American Rescue Plan motion and how an equi uh, equity formula was built in. So for our American Rescue Plan uh, is allocating a total of $1.9 billion into LA County to address the hardships that communities face during the pandemic. And data shown that the most negative, negatively impacted communities were our Black, Indigenous, people, uh, populations of color, our women, and then low income. So knowing that a large amount of funds were coming into the county and that you know, we had communities that were hit the hardest, there were uh, advocates uh, and different organizations that really pushed for equity to be prioritized in the spending of the ARPA dollars. So in this push, it resulted in Supervisor Mitchell and Barger uh, making a motion that dedicated an equity formula for how these dollars should be spent and how departments uh, can advocate for these dollars. And with that, that motion was passed and they're now in the implementation part of that. So there is an ARPA equity dashboard. So departments have to go through uh, different equity offices within the county for approval and review before uh, they can receive any of these dollars. And also they have, uh, they're using equity tools to show like if this program is reaching the most targeted areas that we want that have the highest need. There's also different contracting barriers that they have um, worked on to really uh, make sure that aren't barriers uh, for CBOs and small businesses to really access these funds as well. So really getting into AB 1869 and 177 and its impact on the budget. And some of these slides I'm gonna pass through because Stephanie did a great job at describing what AB 1869 and 177 are. 
Um, so the impact on these bills, uh, they will relieve more than 16 billion in outstanding criminal fees. Uh, we talked about that there's gonna be around 65 billion for AB 1869, that's already built into legislation, and then around 50 million for AB 177. And the goal is to offset lost revenues that would have been received because of those fines. Uh, and we see those investments happening in fiscal year 2022, so that's this year, and then uh, keep an eye out for uh, this upcoming budget to see how these dollars really drop and where they're going. Uh, so the research question really is like, what budget adjustments occurred in fiscal year 2022 that dealt with the impacts of Assembly Bill 1869 and 177? So here we have the adopted budget. So this is the budget that passed in June. Uh, and in this square, this is where the budget tells you like, what did the county do? Um, so we found out that it was described. Uh, so that means that the county knew that money was coming down uh, and they decided that they were, gonna, they were going to delete vacant positions within the probations department. And that's how they were going to uh, uh, attribute for some of the loss of revenue in addition to the one-time backfill that was coming from the state. So we see that in a vacant position is money that's tied up within staffing. So there were positions within probation that uh, were vacant, so nobody was filling that. Uh, so the money is tied up into that labor job. So they were gonna delete that. So that's money that is now freed up for them. Uh, and we see later in this next slide that probation lost of revenue was around 6.6 .6 million but the state came in with over um, a little bit over 8 million uh, to set aside, uh, to offset that loss of revenue. And then here, this tells you in more detail about where the probation office saw the losses um, from that 6.6. .6. And so we see uh, probation saw the influx of funds from AB 1869, but also the trial court saw an influx. Uh, so we see that they would have lost around uh, 940000 but then they saw influx from the state to offset. So that was a direct offset of those funds. Probation saw a little bit more, and trial court saw about the same. Um, and this tracks with the amount of funds that were coming down from Stephanie's presentation uh, from the state. And then looking into fiscal year 23, like we see AB uh, 177 mentioned in the governor's budget and really towards the trial court uh, backfill. So we see that the state is uh, saying that 13.4 million of ongoing funds is going to go to counties to backfill the estimated loss of revenue. Uh, and then for future, when we're doing our budget advocacy and looking at the budget, we know that uh, 9210 is the criminal justice fee backfill, and they're estimating for this year, which is in this uh, last column, about 50 million to go out. But to note that there's also a line item above that has criminal justice fee backfill um, for about 65 million. So the 65 million. So there may be a total of 110 million going out for this fiscal year to be estimated, but this latter one for 50 million is where we see a direct AB 177 um, line item. So just to note that. Um, so some big takeaways is that the state is going to allocate about 13.4 million of ongoing uh, to at the trial courts. Uh, so really keep a lookout for when we're looking at the budget to look at a uh, trial court, but also probation since we've seen at least in LA County that funds were trickled down to probation department. So some overall takeaways is really understanding your local budget priorities and your timeline that helps you build up your advocacy demands. Um, there's multiple opportunities to engage in the budget process that helps move the change that you wanna see. So make sure you're working with your community to build up power and move already existing systems. And then also noting uh, that we saw some of AB 1869, AB 177 come down in fiscal year 2022, but to keep a lookout for
how our local budgets and governments are really projecting that to happen um, in this fiscal year, uh, FY23. Uh, to really use that to track how money is being spent and also to help in advocacy for where that money should be going. Um, and with that, I can pass it back to Adriana. Thank you, Mayana. That was an incredible breakdown. And I hope that everybody else is doing what I'm doing, which is trying to plot out a budget advocacy timeline in their head. Um, one of the things I really appreciated that you said was um, about the importance of community power building and political education in this in this process. And so next, we are actually going to hear from some experts on um, exactly that. Um, so I'd love to introduce our speakers, um, who are Paul Sook from the Youth Justice Coalition and let's Get Free LA, um, a coalition working on fines and free fees in LA County. Um, Fidel Chagola and Avalon Edwards, um, who are out of the inland region, working with Riverside All of Us or None and Starting Over Inc. Um, Paul Briley and Michelle Lau out of San Francisco, working with LSPC and All of Us or None and the San Francisco Financial Justice Project. Um, so we're going to hear from them about their experiences doing budget advocacy, um, generally and specifically relating to AB 1869. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to you, Paul. For sure. So I'm Paul Sokin with the Youth Justice Coalition based here in LA. Um, a lot of us at the YGC have been impacted by fines and fees, and so this has been um, pretty important for us to deal with um, and kind of take on. But um, for us, you know, here in the county, you know, a lot of our advocacy has always been to how can we move from these structures? How can we move from these systems of oppression um, and bring it back to the community and bring that, bring that money and that resource back? Because um, these are ultimately at the end, they are tax dollars. These are the things that we, we've put forward. Um, and so, you know, we've done a lot of kind of that work on the ground um, and being plugged in with communities, et cetera, with counties. Um, unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of obstacles in that, but um, a lot of stuff that we have worked on um, in terms of pushing forward, you know, us here in LA, we have a coalition, Let's Get Free LA, um, that we've been tracking this for quite a while. We started, you know, we have to suffer no fines, no fees, no bail, no jail. Um, and, you know, we've moved on from that for the past, you know, about four or five years now. Um, and so we've been continuing to advocate through that time, whether it's been through direct actions or whether we've gone to the board when, you know, things were a little more open and we've had actions inside the board. And, you know, we had like this Grinch thing where we had a young person just kind of like taking stuff from people to kind of emulate, um, like, what is really happening? Um, through these, these fees and it's taking stuff away from folks like food and et cetera, things that they need for their families. Um, so a lot of the, the ad, advocacy on our end has looked like, um, you know, has been engaging where, you know, where those opportunities are, whether it's through public processes, whether it's through budgets, board hearings, um, whatever the case may be, right, whatever opportunities there are. And a lot of times, you know, it's also with communications on folks that are working inside the government, um, whether it's agencies or staffers or whatever, wherever they may be. Um, and we've been able to engage and, you know, so we continue to have these conversations and move things forward. But part of it also is, um, you know, unfortunately the counties, you know, LA County is sometimes seen as this progressive place and sometimes it's really not. And these are the conversations that we encounter. And so sometimes what we found, um, not just necessarily with, with money in particular through fees, but just in general, is like sometimes we actually have to go to the state to go make things happen. Um, and, you know, here in LA, fortunate enough, we were able to get some start on fees here in the county and the county decided to let go of what it could, but you know, with those limitations. And so, you know, we had to go forward and go to the state and obviously get involved with um, maybe 869 and, you know, AB 177, et cetera, to get things moving forward. But, um, you know, it's been important to move those things through and to get those things out because um, we have to actually make them do something sometimes. Um, but speaking to that, it's kind of like, these are the obstacles. These are the challenges that we faced. These are the things that we've had to deal with. Um, and oftentimes, you know, there's, and any time that we've gone through, we've tried to do something in general, it has been this blanket policy that they tend to put around that's like not written, but we find out to be in practice, this really happens. So we say it's a blanket policy where the CEO um, is essentially buffered and has like a really large insulated blanket around them in terms of making the choices that they can make. And, you know, the board just kind of goes with it and goes with the flow. And so, you know, there's been some challenges around that. You know, sometimes, we know something is coming. Um, like for us, we knew that the funding was coming. And so we've been targeting, we've been hitting, we've been asking, we've been reaching out. 
we've been checking in, like, hey, man, can we get to this? Can we get this? <laughs> you know, we know this money's coming down. Can we move this? You know, sometimes it's like, hey, you know, you also got to do this. You got to do that. You know, and there's obstacles where they just don't get back at us. I'm going to be real with y'all. Sometimes they just don't communicate with us in return, right? So that lack of <laughs> reciprocity or a lack of answers. And sometimes um, what I've learned is that sometimes an obstacle is their own ignorance of what's really happening in many ways, right? So we as community have to go and put pressure and have to let them know that these things are happening. Sometimes they don't even know what's going on with, with the money that's coming down. And they were like, oh, we didn't know. And we were like, hey, we know it's here. We've already confirmed it. Like, can you just go check on it? And so, you know, it has been a lot of that, it has been a lot of communication back and forth. Um, but there's definitely a lot of different obstacles. And sometimes we're trying to move things forward. Um, and we just hit, we just hit some walls and it's been hard. And so, you know, those things, you know, we think strategically about those things and how can we get around it? How can we, other, what are other avenues that we can um, collaborate with or try to like access and get into? You know, LA County has, you know, various different meetings, their public meetings, public hearings. And, you know, we go and be strategic where we can, we provide public comment, we provide, you know, we mobilize folks in the community, provide, you know, information on what's going on. So, you know, communities can be well informed to know what they got to do or what they got to say or what they need and, you know, express um, what it is that they really need. But, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the county is the county, it's the government. Um, you know, it's five supervisors here in LA and all the places it's different, but in LA in particular, we have five supervisors. Um, right now we have five women, um, you know, sometimes they're for chance to five queens, <laughs> but um, some, sometimes you would think that, you know, they would be the most progressive place, you know, being five women, but that's not always the case. Um, and, you know, sometimes they may want to do something in particular, but then there's always opposition, uh, whether it's coming from like law enforcement, et cetera. Um, you know, one thing I have seen I can say too is, is an obstacle is, you know, when it's time to move money, um, like we could go to a hearing and ask for money and we try to do whatever we need to do. So folks on the ground can be supported. And it's like, oh, you gotta go through all this red tape. You gotta get on this agreement. You gotta get on this list. You gotta become a vendor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so there's all this stuff that we have to do, but you know, <laughs> I saw like literally a sheriff asking for something and it was like, okay, bam, here you got it. And it was like a single line item transfer. You know, it's so much easier for them to just do stuff and pay themselves and move things. But it's, some, it's like really, really hard to get out to the community. So that's why, you know, we use the strategies that we do, um, whether it's submitting letters, whether it's finding who it is that we need to talk to, uh, whether it's finding somebody to author a motion and put it up for us, um, whatever it is. And, you know, we get together and we try to figure that out. Where do we really want to move to? Um, Adrian, I'm going to take over the screen for a second. I'm going to show some slides and we just want to remind folks why we do what we do. So, all right. When California, when they took this land, when they stole the land um, and created California, all the way up until like 1980, these are all the prisons that were here, 12 prisons. And then we got into the 80s, right? It's really started extracting from our communities. And that's where it gets really, really wild. Building prison after prison, after prison, gang databases, after another prison, Another prison, another prison for women, another prison, All right? These are the things that they've done, another prison, another prison, and 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 another one. 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 And that's all they built in terms of student debts to go get your graduate education. Pretty crazy, huh? But that's why we do what we do. You know, these systems, these structures that have been built using taxpayer dollars, et cetera, um, that's what they've created for us, for our communities. And everybody that's gone to that prison has faced some type of fine, some type of fee, something through the court system, somehow, some way. 
Um, and so, you know, we really need to kind of pull back on that. We need to get our wealth back. We need to get stuff back to our communities. So you can see they built more prison beds and they did student desks. I mean, it speaks for itself. And so it's very important that we continue to engage on this and continue to go forward. Um, but man, I know I hate running those slides because I'm always like another one, another one, another one, and another one. So anyways, hopefully, you know, we can get to somewhere better and we can move on forward. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it along. Thanks for grounding us in that, Paul. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to um, Fidel and Avalon who actually have some experience fighting um, their county's attempt to take money that was meant to support communities um, and pumping that money right back into jails. Um, so Fidel and Avalon, um, please let us know about your experience working on budget advocacy. For sure, thanks Adriana. And thank you, Paul. I always appreciate hearing you speak um, and seeing those graphics you know, is a reminder that taxpayers are paying for that, right? And so um, all of the money that's coming from impacted families, impacted individuals being funneled back into that prison system. Um, so I guess I could talk briefly about some of the CARES Act funding, uh, and then I'll pass it to Fidel to talk a little bit more about um, the advocacy he's been working on with the IE Fair Chance Coalition that has been leading the work in both Riverside and San Bernardino counties in terms of um, getting a hold of that, that backfill funding um, and hopefully redirecting it to the folks who have been most impacted by harmful criminal justice system fines and fees in the first place. But um, yeah, I can just touch on, um, you know, when CARES Act funding started coming down from the federal government, um, departments can choose how aggressive they wanna be about applying for that funding. And as always, law enforcement was the most aggressive um, in terms of applying for that. And so our sheriff's department in Riverside County um, applied for, I think it totaled around $8 million of CARES Act funding for facilities um, renovations. So buying new office materials, um, upgrading the key system for the buildings to be a touchless keypad or something rather than physical keys. Um, my favorite was making the windows in some of their buildings bulletproof. Um, and so we're seeing money that is explicitly for a coronavirus relief for those most impacted in our communities by COVID um, being grabbed by law enforcement at the, the first opportunity to just funnel it right back into a system that these are A, things that they should be paying for. And they clearly things that they don't even need in the first place. They saw this funding as, as extra that was up for grabs and they grabbed it. Uh, and what we saw on the county level um, was we had public comment. We saw this coming down the line. We saw it on the board agenda. We had dozens of people call in saying, you know, we want CARES Act funding. If the sheriff's department is going to get it, it has to go at, at the very least to making sure that the COVID conditions inside the jails that they run, the five jails that they run, um, are going to be better because we had huge COVID outbreaks in the Riverside County jails, right? Um, at the very least, if not out, outreach through a different department, right? Just not even having this go to law enforcement in the first place. Um, and the board ignored it. Um, five out of five passed, uh, voted to pass these, it was three different votes. Um, and it was unanimously approved from all three supervisors. And what we learned from that, and we're thankful for the ACLU in, in filing um, a complaint to the federal government that I believe is still underway, um, but saying, look, this is blatantly an inappropriate use of funds. Um, because when you see that that level of county government is not going to hold a sheriff accountable or a DA accountable, then you have to go <laughs> to the, the source of the funding. Um, and so the obstacles in that is the entire local political sphere, right? You're looking at five supervisors who are scared to go against the sheriff or fully support him and his agenda of, of law, and, law and order, tough on crime. Um, and so it looks like working with other community members, bringing folks to those meetings to, to feel that outrage about how their taxpayer dollars are being spent um, and complaining to a higher body if that's ever possible. So I'll, I'll pass it to Fidel to talk a little bit about the work that he's been doing with the Inland Empire Fair Chance Coalition on this backfill funding. Well, thank you for that, Avalon. My name is Fidel Chigoya. I'm with uh, Riverside Officer Nun, San Bernardino. Um, 
yeah, why do we do what we do? Like, like Paul said, uh, uh, a lot of the times, uh, it's been people impacted as well. Like knowing how it feels, um, when you come home and you only get those $200 or you got to pay for that bus ride back. You know, it's, it's going through things like that and then going into the community and not even wanting to access any of the resources that uh, they may be offering because pros offering them, probation's offering them. Uh, but when you try to access them, they're not even welcoming. Uh, they, they, they really don't care. So, so, so the thing is, is like, that's where community-based organizations uh, come into place because we build that community. We help uh, uh, our people that are returning home uh, want to access these resources. So how did we uh, come about with the AB uh, 1869 funding? Um, well, by building relationships within the communities uh, and staying consistent, um, reaching out, seeing what events are going on, what are they working on? And uh, that's how um, started being a, we started being a part of the Inland Empire Fair Chance Coalition, which originally started from uh, AB 1008 which is a fair chance act. And what it is, it's a coalition of community-based service providers, advocates, researchers, and returning citizens working closely with state and local government agencies. Um, so that's how we came about knowing about the funds, the backfill funds, and we started being a part of it. Um, so then we started collaborating among different organizations such as uh, Rethink Public uh, Safety San Bernardino Coalition, the Inland Empire Fair Chance Coalition, uh, Congregations Organized for Profit Engagement, COPE, Project Rebound, Operation New Hope, and uh, all of us, Rivers at All of Us are None. And then we started uh, reaching out, getting letters ready, um, editing them, um, continuing the conversations, and then reaching out to uh, supervisors, uh, the Board of Supervisors, which the first one we reached out to was uh, Joe Baca Jr. to have the conversation about where we would like to see these funds being allocated um, with community-based organizations being at the table. Um, and the, the conversations were seeming like we were getting somewhere. Uh, they were listening, he was listening, seemed supportive. However, uh, what I was noticing about um, being a part of those meetings was that uh, it, we were being referred to like, the sheriff, uh, which is Sheriff Shannon Dickus, uh, about like, well, maybe you should reach out to the sheriff. So that kind of made me think like, okay, well, why do we need to reach out to the sheriff? Well, because of public safety. Uh, so that's where our challenges are coming because that was the first meeting we had with Baca Jr. And then the second one we had with uh, Hagman, which we were recommended the same thing as well is to reach out to the sheriff uh, to see about how we could collaborate um, with the sheriffs because they're already trying to uh, have meetings set up um, before us to talk about this funding, this backfill money. Um, and we also were able to uh, attend one of the um community corrections partnership subcommittees uh about some other funding and when we got there that sh the sheriff was there uh but we came at the end of it when they were already making the decisions so it's like uh it's very important for us to be at these tables it's very important for us to advocate as community organizations uh whether we're in la uh, Riverside, our San Bernardino, our relationship building uh, is, is the power of uh, getting our people involved, staying up to date uh, as things uh, unfold. So that way we will be at the table and um, we're ready. Just to add to something you said, Fidel, like I, I think that's, you know, both supervisors saying, well, you got to talk to the sheriff, right? Like, the, the default and the automatic is anything related to public safety falls in the sheriff's lap. And that means a ton of extra funding falls in the sheriff's lap in, in, in both Riverside and San Bernardino counties. And so it's 
an issue of changing that narrative too, like more than just with this particular funding, but like changing the narrative that anything regarding public safety falls under the wheelhouse of the sheriff rather than community-based organizations or public health and, and other departments that that do have play a huge role in public safety, I just think is is key because I'm sure that's going to happen when we start meeting with Riverside County supervisors too. Well, you know, you got to talk to the sheriff, you got to work with the sheriff. And um, I think it's just a sign of, of where these two counties in particular are oriented in terms of public safety for sure. Thank you, Avalon and Fidel. Um, thank you so much for sharing that experience. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Paul and Michelle to talk about their experience um, trying to get a seat at that table um, and get the funds to go back to community. So um, Paul and Michelle, please take it away. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, what was very unique about San Francisco was that many of the criminal justice administrative fees, including 1869, were already repealed in San Francisco. In May of 2018, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors voted unanimously to eliminate all of our local criminal administrative fees. San Francisco was the first county in the nation to eliminate these unjust fees, which stripped resources from the communities most impacted by our criminal legal system and particularly our black community. Um, in San Francisco, the black community, the native black San Franciscans make up less than 3% of the population. However, they're roughly around 70% of the jails. Um, so we had that in mind, but given that San Francisco already repealed these fees, as a result, 1.2 million per year for five years uh, will be coming to the city and county of San Francisco as part of AB 169, 1869 to backfill the cost to eliminate um, the criminal administrative fees to ensure the money wouldn't get swept under the rug or rather go to the general fund and the police. We got ahead of the ball before the board of supervisors were even talking about it. And we actually wrote a letter to the mayor. I specifically wrote a letter to the mayor um, in camaraderie with all of our allies and community-based organizations in San Francisco, letting them know that we had our eyes on this money and that it was on our radar. Um, we were adamant that the backfill funds not go to a law enforcement agency and instead be reinvested in the black community, which has been the hardest hit by these fees. We have requested that the funds go to provide stabilization housing for justice involved individuals and explore the idea of a guaranteed income for justice involved individuals. Community groups in our coalition uh, remain committed to addressing the critical unmet need of providing stabilization housing for justice involved individuals who are unstably housed or at the highest risk of homelessness. These individuals are people coming out of jail, homeless or at risk of homelessness. Be that as it may, housing is just the first step to reentry. There is an opportunity to continue to support formerly incarcerated people with financial resources to ensure strong reentry outcomes through a guaranteed income. Guaranteed income has been shown to be effective by ensuring individuals could meet their basic needs of housing and food, improve their physical and mental well being, and allow people to seek employment or other opportunities, such as education and training. We believe that stabilization housing and a guaranteed income for justice involved individuals would significantly impact the outcomes of reentry, recidivism, and community safety. Um, we're currently back and forth with the mayor's office, just making these proposals and just letting them know that, you know, our eye is very much on, you know, the, uh, the backfill funding. We have over 20 community-based organizations alongside with us, making sure that, you know, the money doesn't go to law enforcement. And me being from San Francisco, I wholeheartedly represent the black community of San Francisco and I realize how much we are in need. I realize how much we are penalized by these fines and fees. 
and just um, the mayor, she's from the black community in San Francisco as well. So I know she can relate. Um, and that's just what we're pushing as far as proposals and what we think should uh, the money should go to. Thanks, Paul. Um, and hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Lau. I'm with the San Francisco Financial Justice Project. Um, we're housed in the treasurer's office. Um, so we're within the city and county of San Francisco government. Um, and our team was set up to look at our city's fines and fees. Um, so we've been working pretty closely with Paul and other community groups to kind of facilitate this proposal behind the scenes. Um, so, you know, after Paul kind of sent that initial letter, you know, we followed up with the mayor's office. Um, we also sort of reached out to the State Department of Finance um, to kind of track down the funds as soon as we could. Um, so as Paul said, we've been working with the mayor's office um, on the two proposals. So the stabilization housing for people who are just as involved and the guaranteed income for people who are just as involved. Um, so our kind of where we are right now is that the mayor's office has committed to ensuring the funds do not go back into a law enforcement agency. Um, but they, you know, were interested in hearing kind of ideas about how those funds should be used. Um, so as Paul said, we've had a few meetings with the mayor's office. Um, we are definitely in budget season right now. Um, so this is kind of the time of year where the mayor is weighing different priorities and these proposals are, are being considered um, as part of the budget for fiscal year 22-23, um, so the next fiscal year. Um, yeah, and just to wrap up, I think some of the, the key things that we really tried to do in San Francisco are, are one, just to get in front of the, the funding as soon as we knew it was coming to San Francisco. So it wasn't being swept you know, into a law enforcement agency or, or back into the sheriff or probation um, or the police. And then kind of worked with um, community groups um, and Paul to develop pretty detailed proposals about you know, how we wanted to see the funds being spent. Um, so Adrian, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you for sharing all of that. And it was really inspiring to hear about all of your ideas for where this money could go instead of law enforcement to support our communities. So I'm now actually going to turn that question um, to our audience. Um, so we're going to be distributing a poll in just a second. We wanna hear where you think that these funds should be used in your county. So some of these things are things that you heard some of our panelists speak to today, like housing for system impacted people and, and services, community-based services. Um, if you don't see your answer here, we welcome you to put it in the chat. Um, I've already heard one today that I, I don't think is on the list, which is uh, a guaranteed income. Um, but yeah, we'd love to hear what you think should be prioritized. Um, and then the next question we have is, do you have government allies? So we, we heard about a few different political contexts, right? We heard about um, LA County where there are people that we can approach, supervisors we can approach, but sometimes they don't always get back at us. And sometimes they defer to the county CEO, right? So, and then we heard about, um, you know, the experience in Riverside where there's not a lot of, um, uh, persuadable uh, government officials in, in county government. And then we heard about San Francisco where there was a government ally in the form of the Financial Justice Project in the form of the treasurer's office that could help behind the scenes and potentially a persuadable mayor. Um, and then the last question we'd love to hear from you about is, are there partners in your community that you can see yourself working with? Um, I think one thing that we heard all of our panelists talk about was the importance of coalition partners, of community partners to ground us and, and to go with us to, to show our elected officials that there really is power um, behind our ask. So um, go ahead and answer the poll and we look forward to seeing what you think. And while we are all doing that, um, I'm going to turn it over to our um, panelists to kick off our Q&A. So Paul, wondering, um, Paul from LA, wondering if you have uh, any questions for the rest of our panelists. Yeah, for sure. Um, actually, to Fidel and Avalon, I, I wanted to reflect on something y'all talked about, like they defer to, to policing. Um, they defer to them to like automatically. Um, so my question to y'all is how frustrating is that to you and what can folks do out there to like support y'all because in LA, man, it's frustrating to, to see that. So 
just just want to hear from your side over in the IE where it's probably worse than LA, just to be honest. Like that's the nature of, of the IE. So if y'all got something to say on that. Um, oh. Fidel, you go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, it is very frustrating when you're attending these meetings and you're seeing how they're they're headed. And then at the end, it, it sounds like, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, we're, we're, we're for you, we're for you. And then at the end of it, it's like, but you have to reach out to this person. It's like, uh, and and the way that that we could be supported, I think we definitely have to strategize more um, with these org or the organizations as well, um, and develop relationships uh, where it's going to be a uh, like like I think in San Francisco they have a relationship with the mayor. So we're gonna have to start reaching out to like um, other elected officials as well. And we could definitely use some support from folks out in LA. I think y'all are incredibly well organized between a few different really amazing organizations out there. Like it's not that long of a drive. Um, I think we often need, you know, this isn't budget specific, but we often need like bodies in the room, you know, and just to let folks know in LA County what's going on in Riverside is huge because, um, we don't have, you know, we, we have tons of engaged community members, but like but the numbers aren't there. We have never packed the room at a, at a supervisor's meeting to talk about our budget asks, right? We, we get a few dozen people at, at the best showing of the year, right? So um, I think especially with LA, that kind of support of sharing when we're having, you know, events or calls to action um, and getting the word out to folks there um, would be would be huge, but yeah. Totally agree with everything Fidel said. Thanks. And um, now I'd just like to invite the audience um, to drop any questions they might have for our panelists in the chat. Um, yeah, not to put you all on the spot, um, Avalon and Fidel, but if you have a question um, for any of our other panelists, um, please, um, we'd love to continue the discussion. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm curious about how how things um, have worked in the San Francisco context, right? Because it's so different. And then hearing like having an, an ally in the mayor's office and having the mayor already commit to not putting that money towards public safety. Like, I feel like we can't even envision that step. What do you do then, right? Like when you have that political ally, when you have somebody who said on paper or in a meeting or whatever that like, yes, I'm with you what comes after that? Like, how do you make sure that they, they stay with their word? Do you then like invest yourselves in them as a political candidate and say, hey, this person backed us up when we needed them, we're gonna back them up? Cause you know, that's not a compromise that we can make, right? Cause the people who, who throw us a crumb sometimes are never gonna be there with us on another issue. And so I guess that's where I'm coming from, from the Riverside context. Paul, do you want to start? Sure, I'll give a have at it. Um, I would say just constantly um, try to set up meetings with them. Um, and also when leaving those meetings have next steps, um, like some of the meetings that we had with a staffer in the mayor's office, um, like they wanted, there were next steps. Like we agreed that within a couple of days, you know, we, we'd have a meeting with them again before they had their meeting with the mayor and we provide them some of the talking points on our behalf. Um, and just, you know, never dropping the ball. Um, you know, uh, we're very fortunate in San Francisco. Um, you know, a lot of stuff ha does happen here first. Um, but yeah, I guess, you know, just continuing to just stay in contact with them um, and having more than one contact as well, um, you know, in the event that you can't get through to who you want to. Yeah, and I'll just add, I think, as Paul said, being very persistent. So we've continued to follow up with our, our mayor's office. Um, we also, you know, have a pretty good relationship with our sheriff, which I know is, is unique to San Francisco. So Paul and, and other community groups, um, we all meet kind of quarterly with the sheriff um, himself and his kind of top um, staff. Um, so I think that's, yeah, also a unique relationship that we've, we've been able to develop. 
um, and yeah, and move forward things like jail phone calls and tablets um, for free. I'm curious, so in Riverside, do you feel as if there's greater opposition than allies? The opposition is really loud and they have a lot of money and a lot of political power. <laughs> That's what I'll say. I don't know, Fidel, if you want to add to that. Yeah, I agree with you, Evelyn. N numbers wise, no. I, where it's like kind of a purple county. Um, but in terms of who's the loudest in the room, it's always going to be um, tough on crime folks. Yeah, right now we're going to change it. But right now that's how it is. So we have a couple um, questions in the chat, which I think are along the same lines, which is how do we find or cultivate government allies that are willing to go to bat for us and work behind the scenes for us, um, particularly in kind of more conservative places, right? Um, so curious about, um, I guess, the processes you all went through um, to figure out who it was that you could actually maybe um, get a foot in the door with. I can take that on. Um, I think when I started at the county, just in terms in general, just not on any like fines or fees anything, but any type of push at the county, um, it was like always showing up to whatever meetings they had. And then I would start to see faces, start to see how staff were doing, start to see how they responded. And I just started talking to them and be like, hey, let me get your number, let me get your car, you know, just to stay in touch and like building that rapport. And over a period of time, you know, we started building, you know, a lot of allyship and it got to a place where I could reach out to somebody like, hey, let's get a meeting. And they're like, cool, what day you got? These are the ones I got. And so, you know, once you start opening those doors, you'll start to find out who they are. And I think the challenges, I think in a lot of places, what I've heard from people too, is that they're like, oh man, our county sucks or our, our jurisdiction sucks. And nobody goes, nobody tries to talk to somebody, right? Nobody goes looking. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to go find those people. They're there, they're somewhere. They're somewhere. It may just be one person, though, unfortunately. And so, you know, it's kind of like a needle in a haystack type piece. And so that's the challenge. Like, how do you find that person? But I think for me, I would say it's just being attended, um, going with folks, and just being observant and trying to find and, you know, just trying to keep an eye out for, like, who is that person? Not just going to give public comment, but go to give public comment and find your ally. Like, go with that eye to look for, for who is this person. Um, and you can see. You know, and just sometimes your gut will lead you to that right person. You just never know. You just got to be there and be persistent. So that's how I got in. And I'll just chime in. Um, in our case in San Francisco, as I mentioned, all of the administrative fees um, were already repealed. But that was actually legislation that was put forward by Mayor Lennon Breed herself when she was the president of the Board of Supervisors. So she was already passionate, you know, about repealing these fees before she was the mayor, which, you know, is another reason why she's so receptive of hearing our proposals and just advancing this even further. Any other thoughts or reflections on that question? All right, I think we have time for one more question. And um, I think I got one in the chat, but if anyone else has anything, please drop it in. Um, but what can we do to support each other? That's the question. What can like our statewide debt-free justice coalition do? What can um, our organizations working in all different counties and regions across the state, what can we do to mutually support each other? I can kick us off on that one. Mutual support, huh? <laughs> um, I think for us, it's always been like coalition building. Um, anytime we've tried to move something um, at the state level or whatever, it's always been building with people. But the one thing that we tend to focus on in LA that I've seen, to be successful in any campaign has always been to put the leadership of directly impact people at the front. Because um, they're always the folks that have the passion, the drive, they're the folks that have felt it, you know, like felt it directly. And so there's one thing that, you know, like legislators or officials can say, they can, oh, you're giving me false stats or you're skewing it. But the thing is, you can never tell somebody your experience 
isn't valued or your experience is a lie. You can't tell somebody what they did and experience. Can't do that, you know? Um, so they just have to accept what, <laughs> what person says. And it doesn't have to be, um, you know, an impacted person doesn't have to come with all that data and stuff. They can just be like, look, man, this is what happened. Y'all did this to me. That was your decision. That was your choice. Um, and this is how it, it hurt us. You know, it did this, it did that, whatever. So, um, you know, folks can really speak to that because at the end of the day, moving stuff, I've seen in successes, it's not through logic or through reasoning a lot of times. It's, you got to capture like a decision maker's heart. Let's just be honest about it. You got to get them to move with their emotions. I'm like, I ah, got to feel guilty. Sometimes that's the only thing that will make them move. They literally have to feel guilty. Other than that, they can brush it off and go to sleep at night, right? You got to make sure they lose some sleep. But, you know, if impacted folks aren't there at the core, at the front lines, it's, it's not going to happen, you know, because it's just going to be all logic and reasoning a lot, unfortunately. Um, but to the other question, how you can find somebody, sometimes you got to send somebody in. That's another thing. Sometimes you got to send someone in. Somebody's got to be willing to be that, that brave wolf and go inside and tear it down. Any other thoughts from our panelists, how we can help support each other? All right. Um, I think then we're just going to wrap things up with some resources. Um, Stephanie, you want to take it away? Yeah, let me share my screen again really quick. Um, so yeah, just some quick things before we close out. Um, we have a lot of resources for people. Um, we have a sample county level resolution um, drafted by our friends at San Francisco Financial Justice Project. No county has yet uh, um, adopted this type of resolution, but again, hopefully it's a helpful starting point in conversations. Also encourage people to check out Debt Free Justice California's website where we share a little bit about um, the updates to ongoing work to eliminate these fines and starting now with restitution in California. We also have um, flyers on that website about AB 1869 and 177 under the resources tab. So encourage people to check that out. Um, we also have um, kind of service providers that have um, share their information to help people navigate fees and uh, that are continuing to be charged to them. So if you have people um, that you know across California that are um, still facing fees that are no longer authorized um, or have questions, definitely feel free to reach out to these folks. Um, all of this information again is on um, the Debt Free Justice California website. Um, I'm sure that we'll share all of the panelists' contact information, um, but the last thing I will plug is um, again, the coalition has a Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram account. Definitely follow um, us. We def try to keep um, updates there. We also have a listserv um, and a monthly call. So if you're interested in joining that, um, feel free to email me or Adriana. We can drop our emails in the chat. Um, always welcome more people um, into the conversation. And with that, I will throw it back to Adriana to officially close out. Yeah, thank you to all of our panelists um, for all of the great information. Um, and I think we just shared the results of the poll. Um, I, my big takeaway from that is that there are a lot of places that we think it would be really valuable um, for this money to go that's not probation and the sheriff. Um, and that there are some good opportunities for us to work with our community organizations, with our people's budget coalitions um, to get that done. So thank you all again for joining us and thank you to our presenters. Have a great evening.